Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Edinburgh. It's great to see so many people here and lots of familiar faces from our last meeting and also from the university community that I recognise. Um, so this meeting has been organised jointly with friends of Scotland, um, and they're going to hear from them a bit later. And we're going to do the meeting in two parts. So we're going to first of all hear about Paris and 1.5 degrees report. So Kevin's going to tell us some, some of his views about that, and we'll have some discussion then around that. And then for the second part, we'll move more towards Scotland's targets. Kevin and his colleagues have written a report, Friends of the Earth, which has been discussed, findings have been discussed today in Holyrood. So there'll be some discussion about Scotland and particularly what we can do as a community ourselves. So, the, so we'll hear a bit more about that from Friends of the Earth later. Um, Caroline Grants and, and Richard Dixon are here um, from Friends of the Earth. So thank you for organising this with us. And of course, thank you very much to David Somerville, who's done a lot of the work behind this meeting. Um, so Kevin Anderson, so I guess he's known to many of you. Um, he's Deputy Director of the Timber Centre Climate Change Research. He's based in Manchester. Um, he's, he's well known for his rigorous, his incisive and science-based analysis of carbon budgets and their relationship to climate mitigation policies, as well as his analysis of the response of policymakers and the scientific community to these insights. It makes for a unique and potent brew of climate science, policy, sociology and politics. And Kevin does not shy away from the political implications nor the implicit political and social assumptions that shape and frame discussion of carbon budgets. Um, so I'm going to now hand over to Kevin, and we'll hear for about 50 minutes, and then I'm going to hand over to David, and David will mediate this, the discussion part. Okay, thank you. Oh, you all hear me okay? Yeah. Yep, good. Um, so I'll try and just shoehorn in this bit about 1.5 degrees C into a, into a wider presentation. Um, and I've been told, told to try and keep it so we, you know, constructive about what the things that we can do about climate change. But it's also important to remind ourselves of what the challenges to which we have to respond. Um, nebulous arm waving is what we've done for 28 years on climate change. It's almost nowhere. Um, so I've called this here Climate's Holy Trinity, Cogency, Tenacity, and Courage. Um, I have a Twitter account which don't even work, even so you can on that if you want to. Um, so uh, I'm going to start off with a quick thought experiment. So just sit there thinking about this. Um, imagine, that's going to be very hard to imagine, imagine climate change was actually considered a serious existential threat. I know none of us think like that, it's just a little ruse. But um, imagine we actually thought climate change was serious. And then imagine we had regulations that forced the top 10% of global emitters to reduce their carbon footprint to the average European level. So, you know, is that too much to ask? Just for 10%. And the other 90% do nothing, just carry on as normal. Same number of emissions. So it's just 10%. Some of you may have heard me say this sort of thing before, but do you have any idea what the reduction in global emissions would be? One third. So only 10% reduced their level to the level of the average European, not the average Ghanaian. And that's a one third cut in global emissions. And then you add the Paris agreements together. Paris pledges, and you get no reduction by 2030. Are you talking individuals or companies? No, this is the activities of individuals. So it's the high emitting individuals. It's the activities. It's based on the Chancel and Piketty report for 2015. You, you can tease it out from their analysis. You have to do the calculation itself. But. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to come back to that later, but it feeds into my provocation that the rapidly dwindling 1.5 and 2 degrees C carbon budgets aligned with emission responsibilities, that I just tried to allude to there anyway, embed equity at the heart of any real mitigation agenda. That wasn't true in 1990, when the first IPCC report came out, or in 2000, and in 2018, I think, equity is an absolutely pivotal, central issue that comes out of the maths respond to climate change. The taboo issue of the huge asymmetric distribution of wealth underpins the international community's failure to seriously tackle climate change. Now, it sounds like a socialist agenda, but I think you can show that again just via the maths. And only when we acknowledge these inequalities will thinking on climate change be sufficiently mature to transition from incrementalism to system change. All we've had so far is incrementalism at best. So that's my provocation. And this is the world 
that dominates, I think, at the moment, the model that dominates how we think about climate change and pretty much everything else. So you're probably all very familiar with this. This sort of view of the Davos fraternity, the morally bereft. Um, and the, the way forward, of course, is steady as she goes. We're fine, we're doing just fine. It maintains the dominant economic paradigm and continued growth of resources and power skewed to a privileged few. And I'll try and come back to this later on. It particularly holds for emissions, but I think it also holds this the end of austerity. I never saw austerity. No other professor did either. Only poor people saw austerity. Um, and on climate, I would argue that the Davos paradigm is legitimized by a whole suite of what I refer to pejoratively, I'm proud to say that, the climate glitterati. <laughs> Mark Carney, Adair Turner, John Gummer, Nick Stern, one of the nicer ones of this group, Christiana Figueres, Bloomberg, Al Gore. These people have carbon footprints the size of very large African towns, if not small states, um, and they tell the rest of us to reduce our emissions. So in addition to this, you know, this group who went about flying around the world in their private jets, um, they're supported by a whole cadre of senior climate academics who get their kudos from rubbing shoulders from this group and occasionally being invited to talk, talk to them. And this is not support offsetting negative emission technologies, geoengineering, carbon capture and storage, and green growth. Now, there's good work being done on these things, but this is what, this is, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to use to respond to these challenges. And I don't mean here the PDRAs, the, you know, the postdocs. I don't mean the, the, the lecturers. This is generally the very senior, usually grey-haired, often then, but not always, <laughs> professors who have said nothing interesting in the last 10 years. It's all about incremental evolution within the system. We mustn't question the system. And that's, I would have argued, why we've responded to climate change with complete inaction. So let's put some bones uh, some flesh, uh, or like flesh on the bones of this, uh, this provocation. Um, but I'm going to start off here with a climate message from the Pope. But I can't remember if I used this one before. I think I used um, uh, Feynman last time, this time it's the Pope. In lines of technology, if any of you want to look at a book that captures climate change really well, I would recommend the Pope's encyclical. I'm not a Catholic, and you can miss out the spiritual stuff if you want. Um, but actually, captures a lot of the really important issues about climate change in the encyclical. He's very well advised, and he's, you know, he seems to be quite a good writer. The appliance of technology and economics ends up sidelining anything unrelated to its immediate interests. Whereas any genuine attempt to change, um, to, to, to introduce real change, is viewed as a nuisance based on romantic illusions. And we so often hear that. That's not realistic. You can't do that. That will never work. So that's the sort of language we're always hearing that closes down debate, that opens up when we want to open up a box that's too challenging to the system. So what is the international agenda on climate change? Um, well, you're all familiar with the Paris Agreement, um, and what we, what we uh, promise to do is take action. That's quite important to take action. It wasn't just to talk about it. To hold to well below 2 degrees centigrade, and ideally end of 1.5. To do so in accordance with the best science, which I would argue is broadly a carbon budget framework, and on the basis of equity, um, and as I was saying after this afternoon, it's something in Hollywood. No country in the, in, the, in the world has taken any notice of the equity issue, not in the wealthy countries. It's just lip service. We never think about equity issues, and I'll talk about that later on, because how can we already know that issue, including the Committee on Climate Change. But I'll be asked to say something about the 1.5 degrees CE4, which is really, presumably you're all reasonably familiar with, because in the press and um, it was even covered in, I think, the Daily Mail online. <laughs> I'm not sure what it said, I have to say. Um, perhaps I should have read it. Um, so here we have uh, um, a copy of the, of the report. Um, for me, there are two explicit um, and headline conclusions from it, and one Imp implicit message. And I was not keen that we had a 1.5 degree C report. I think in retrospect, I was probably wrong on that. I think in some ways, I think it's a good thing to have. Um, I was very uncertain about actually we spent all this time pretending we did hit 1.5, but I think there are some merits to it. So the two headline conclusions, just using a couple of these slides and the backdrops from the report. The first is the impact, great surprise. The impact at 2 degrees C, I noticed it's really worse than the ones at 1.5. That wasn't a great revelation, I would have thought. But it was interesting to see the work you know, brought together as to what is the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees centigrade other than just half a degree. And there are some significant sets of impacts that we uh, uh, can tease out from the science. But it's also, I think, fair to say there's a lot of uncertainty remaining there. But, you know, it's significantly higher um, ecosystem impacts across the board, pretty much. So regardless of whichever category you look at, it looks noticeably worse. Most of them look mostly worse at 2 degrees C. Um, significantly higher... Uh, Consequently, there are chances of additional feedbacks making the situation considerably worse. 
So 1.5, quite often it was suggesting, well, but we might just be lucky and not have some of the feedback. So two degrees centigrade, there was a greater feeling that we were greater confidence that we wouldn't be getting additional feedback to make the situation worse. And I never know quite how they do this, but around an extra half a billion, in fact, I think it's 420 million, I mean, which is precise to my liking. But anyway, um, about half a billion people, additional people, seriously impacted by climate change if you go to two degrees centigrade rather than 1.5. And that's yeah, quite a significant size of the population. That's more than the population of the EU more than the population of the US. So it's a, you know, a large number of people. Um, the second headline uh, that I think is important is that they, they made the comment, um, and they made this comment and pretty much about everything anyway, uh, that planetary scale negative emissions are a prerequisite of holding to 1.5. So none of the, all the scenarios they considered have um, some form of negative emissions, whether that's afforestation, which I think is problematic, or maybe even reforestation, which is less problematic, um, or lots and lots of negative emission technologies. And what's also important there is if you look at the scenarios, you can see they all go on well beyond the end of the century, which I think we have to bear in mind that almost all the scenarios end up cutting off at 2100, but we're relying on the people in the next century. So some of you might still be alive there with a bit of stem cell research. Your kids <laughs> have a bit for a while, yeah. But, but, the, but the kids and uh, your kids will be having to deal with this, sucking our CO2 out the air. CO2 we put up today, they'll be sucking out in the next century. That's normal model. Just remind ourselves of that. But the, bit, the, the other sort of implicit headline that I think is really disturbing um, and is not, not surprising, and you can probably guess where I'm going with this after my opening slides, is that when we look at um, the, the uh, Sustainable Development Goal number eight, um, well, what a surprise. The IPCC claim, when I say the IPCC, what I mean, the IPCC economists claim few trade offs and strong synergies between hitting 1.5 and economic growth. Well, another wonderful message for us to take home. <laughs> and you look at that, you know, here's the trade offs, the synergies, trade offs, synergies, trade offs. And every time the synergies are bigger than the trade offs. Um, now, I, I made a, wrote a response to the 1.5 report, um, um, which is on the Manchester blog site. So you can have a look at it there if you want to, Manchester University blog site. Um, and I'm just to add this, this quote from it. This is what captures my view. The IPCC, the IPCC report meticulously lays out how the serious um, climate impacts of 1.5 and warming are still far less destructive than those of 2 degrees centigrade. It makes clear 1.5 is not a safe threshold. Sadly, the IPCC then fails again to address the profound implications of reducing emissions in line with 1.5 and 2 degrees C. Dress it up however we may wish, climate change is a rationing issue. Yeah, and that's what it is. We have a certain budget to spend. And you know, more, one person spends more, someone has to spend less. It's a rationing issue. We don't like the language, but tough. We should have done something about it a long time ago. Um, and I would argue that ignoring the huge inequality in emissions, the IPCC chooses to, be, to um, constrain its policy advice to again fit neatly within the current economic model. How can we make the Paris 1.5 degree C fit with Davos? Because we say it's all great synergies with economic growth. Um, so it's not a great just to start from, I think. But then, um, that's my upbeat interpretation of the 1.5 BC before. <laughs> so I think I'll, I'll stop there, and I'll carry on after that. So, um, so back to you, Simon. Yeah. Or, oh, David. Okay. Was that sufficiently upbeat? <laughs> no, I was going to start the best <laughs> Here's the man who studied the science. Um, we thought that before we go into the um, looking at what we might do here locally in Scotland, we get any reflections. Is that working? Are you able to hear me okay? And um, we get some reflections from colleagues in the room. Um, and I'd be particularly glad of any reflections which are um, um, from people with different disciplines to Kevin's. So, any, any, any. Um, any takers for that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you very much. Very, really interesting and inspiring talk. My reflection is that I think when, you, when we're looking at how to frame the climate message in the future, I mean, there's a fair chance that we're going to blow through 1.5 degrees and possibly two degrees when you look at how emissions are increasing, it puts us in a really uncertain future. So the idea of equity, I think, is really important because if we're framing the, the debate, you need to frame it somehow that there's some sort of the positive. And if it really means we have to change uh, you know, everything, 
then at least we frame it as something that's positive, you know, this change can be positive, even if we're going to be in an uncertain future where we don't really know if we're going to get to four or five or six degrees. Um, and I think that's really going to be key because otherwise it's just messages of doomsday or where. Thank you. Um, just, so, so, say who you are, where you're from, if you want, um, in the background. Okay, Alison McDonald from the Dick Vet, the uh, Veterinary School and University. Um, in The Guardian today, there's a report that since 1970, 60% of the animal life on this planet has now gone. And so climate change is also having an impact on animals as well as the human population. And that should be taken into account. Yeah. David? My name is Evie Murray and I'm from a local leaf charity called Leaf Community Crops and Pots. And I'd like to know what Scotland can do about China and their carbon emissions. <laughs> Hi, my name is Willie Black. I'm uh, the United the Union uh, campaigner. Is there anything that you can point to? as an example that they have raised that's positive about what we can do in the present moment so that we in Scotland can maybe be inspired by other people and what they're doing. Um, I understand what you're saying in terms of the system. We have to change the system ultimately or we're doomed. But nevertheless, within the system, is there anything that we can do at this present time and campaign rounds on the scale that's required rather than just tinkering about with blue buckets or cycling. Yeah. Hi, I'm my name is Michaela and I work um, within a community in Midlothian to try to support low carbon behaviour. Um, it's quite a proud community and it's quite a frustrating job <laughs> because obviously these aren't the people that are the way they matter. But obviously we've got government funding. So the thing that I feel positively about is that I see uh, a shift in low-carbon behaviour as a way for social cohesion. So getting people out of their cars, for example, getting people um, into community gardening, getting people together somehow around, so getting them away from... <laughs> You know all these kind of things that we've told we need that we need to sort of be successful human beings. We've stopped realizing that we need each other. Um, uh, but the other thing is, it's obviously it's really frustrating because you can see that there's a system change that needs to happen. And how do we, you know, when I look at all the the plans for roads around our area, when I look at all the new housing built, we're building in kind of like carbon in the future. Like how can we? Well, I, I don't know what to. <laughs> where do we go first to stop that kind of long term? Apart from just like this idea that we can each kind of yeah, yeah, turn off our lights. Thank you. Uh, Mark Winstall, I'm a UK Image Research Centre and uh, uh, as you are, Ken, uh, and uh, University of Edinburgh. So I'm um, slightly worried about uh, babies and bathwaters here because you're, you're saying that, okay, there's something inherently um, um, mis, uh, mis kind of um, misplaced about techno-economics. As an in, it's an inability to deal with this problem, okay? So we've got a, a body rather similar to the IPCC called CCC in the UK, who are doing a pretty good job at the moment of exposing UK government policy failure. There's a guy who runs the IPCC now, Chief Secretary, used to be the head of uh, Scottish Government's Energy Directorate, and he's uh, invited the UK government to explain why it's opposed to some of the lowest cost uh, carbon innovations, carbon technology, why we're not finding least cost routes to system change. So um, by kind of saying this model, this, this framing of experts uh, independently kind of, uh, okay, IPCC won't go and tell national government how to kind of change its economic policies, just won't do that, as, as, uh, as somebody uh, said it recently in Edinburgh. But um, CCC are uh, in the business of doing that now, and they're holding uh, policy uh, makers' feet to the fire on this. So I'm not slightly worried you're kind of undermining one of our uh, institutions who can help us on the way here.
This uh, Kate Garner, also from the Dick Fet. Uh, I had a question about redistributing food in terms of um, one, animals are a great producer of methane, and two, where folks live is not where the food is produced. Um, so obviously there's a lot of CO2 emission uh, that goes into uh, feeding the populations in where we are and kind of approaching that as a obviously a necessary thing, but uh, figuring out how to do that in the best way. Could you pass it back? Hi, I'm Dr. Eleanor Harris uh, from the Confederation of Forest Industries. Um, uh, I was really struck by your first uh, statistic about inequality and the top 10%, um, and I think that's, a, that's really striking and really important. Um, what I was less convinced by was what seemed to be an assumption that inequality, growth in inequality and growth in eco economic growth necessarily go hand in hand. Um, and I think... Um, there's a risk in getting caught up in a rhetoric. Uh, I, I think your, um, I think rationing is exactly right as well. But um, I think um, we risk forgetting how rich we are. Um, most people in China are just reaching the point where they can afford toilet paper. And um, I don't think there's anyone in the room who think that it would be an acceptable, fair situation that we should all get to um, get reduced down to a point where uh, we're not allowed toilet paper. Um, I think we think that was a fairly low standard of um, that everyone else in the world should come up to. So I think I think you're absolutely right about the inequality, um, but I'm not totally convinced about the economic growth. I think there's I think there's more to be thought about um, in there. Hi, I'm Rachel Howell, a lecturer in sustainable development here. Um, I don't have a different perspective to yours, but I just want to clarify the perspective on equity, because we know that middle class people in rich countries don't think of themselves as among the wealthiest people in the world, um, but we are. And so I'm wondering who the 10% top emitters are. Are they all people like Al Gore, or are we the, in the 10%? And I think that would be useful to clarify in terms of the talk of equity. Uh, my name is Ian Bannister from the Rapporteur for Affiliation. Uh, I wonder if you, if you agree that the uh, IPCC report severely underestimated positive feedback feedback effects. An example being that it was suggesting that uh, by the end of this century we would only see uh, a blue ocean event in the Ar Arctic once every, I think it was 100 years. Whereas even Peter Waddams, who's probably the foremost expert on this, in the UK has said that we'll probably see a blue ocean event within the next five years, and then within about five years after that, we'll see one every single year. Um, we'll be wrapping up shortly this little session, which is just some points coming in from different perspectives. <laughs> Just <laughs> <laughs> care from the, again from the vet school. Um, got a question just about the curriculum and whether, from your perspective, in terms of evolving the curriculums across your own university and indeed other universities, you have um, some suggestions as to how we can do that so that we, we can actually integrate that social dimension that you were referring to in terms of in terms of equity and how we actually can do that in a, in a way that meets the needs of all of our stakeholders. <coughs> there are some seats down at the front here if anybody wants to come down. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my name is Tomas, I'm a student from the Masters in Carbon Management. Um, I really like what you said, and like, I've been saying that to my friends for years, but like, it's nice to hear it from someone who has definitely a strong influence than me. Um, I just wanted to say also, like, kind of answering to some of what other people have said, that um, I would say that one of the first things we should do is take businesses and private corporations out of the talks uh, regarding sustainability and climate change. Like, for instance, last Tuesday, uh, there was an event organized by the WWF Scotland, about what Scotland can do to limit their emissions to uh, avoid climate change. And uh, there were business representatives there, and I feel very uncomfortable about that. I don't think private agents should be included in the conversation when it comes to that, and they should just be imposed upon what they have to do. <laughs>
My name is Keith Burns. I'm an engineer. I spent most of my career generating electricity. Um, I'm concerned about the importance of learning from our mistakes. And the example I'd like to cite is the extremely bold experiment that Germany has been carrying out on our behalf, and that is their energy vendor policy. As a result of German energy vendor, Germany now has the highest carbon emissions per capita of any nation in Europe. It's burning more lignite for base load and grid balancing than it has ever done before, and its carbon emissions have gone through the roof. Can you suggest how we can learn from these mistakes, please? Anybody here? How have we got to do before? <laughs> Uh, I'm Johanna Carey from Transition Edinburgh. I've been reading a book by Leo Bartzi about the climate majority. Now, I agree with a lot of what you're saying about um, justice and equality and system change, but his point is we have to untie it from politics so that it's not just the greeny loonies that want this change, it's everybody. I think in Scotland we do have a political majority that says that, but people still think you're a bit loony left if you want these things. If we want the sort of things you're saying about system change, that seems to me it's taking us further left, not more into the middle ground, which might make it difficult to get everybody on board. Hi, Kevin. My name is Ian Stillers. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I'm reading for a PhD in global green energy uh, systems just now. Um, I'm sitting in a few lectures recently uh, and um, we're talking about the energy mix, oil and gas and coal and renewables and nuclear. And people sometimes say, oh, why, why do we still see such a big uh, prevalence of fossil fuels in the energy system? And I say vested interests and people have a jolly good laugh, um, and I don't think that's untrue, but I'd love if you could comment on the impact of inverted commas vested interests um, in this domain, uh, and then I'll go back and tell everyone the case. I'd like to take a couple more, maybe. <laughs> Hello, my name is Louise McKeever, um, I'm with Young Friends Air Scotland and I'm a divestment company. Um, this is just more of a reflection and the speaker talks about yeah, um, system changes. Um, but I actually just want to bring the reality back into the room that for young people, this report isn't something that's just for policy changes. Um, this is the future that we've been handed. Um, and I, I don't have a choice in engaging in this um, um, to say that it puts people off um, to not change the system. It's actually kind of an insult to my generation and the generations after. Um, hello, um, my name's uh, Jacqueline Fletcher and I work for Gaia Education. Um, there was mention up there of food and somebody down there was also talking about the loss of animals. So I would like to know what you think about uh, something that was actually proposed in the IPC report, I think, about regenerative agriculture, but just seems to be dismissed as one of the solutions to actually saving biodiversity and sequestering carbon. That's what somebody done. Yeah, so. <laughs> Could you pass this down? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Maria and I'm a sustainable development student at the university. I'm here. What, what? Hello. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just wondering about the IPCC report or in general, like climate change and how we communicate it. Because like 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees, like for an average person that isn't very interested in climate change, doesn't sound as a big threat. Like it, during summer, if the temperature goes up from 21 to 25. Or like, no, 21 to 23, I'm very bad at maths. And in Norway, where I'm from, we're very happy because there's always snow. But I'm just thinking whether you you have any 
idea of how to communicate it better so climate change becomes more of a tangible thing that we can see and see the effects because right now it's all just a blur and people are talking about it being something that's fake and something that's real so maybe that could be something that could be improved that's enough <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, hi my name's Callum uh, I'm, a, I'm a community worker is what we used to get called and my comment and response to that, I mean, I've listened to the audience here, and it seems to be quite a, an informed audience. The groups that I work with are uh, communities, lots and lots of people that, that are a million miles away from what's just been presented. Uh, and the day-to-day -day conversations that people take place, they're, they're about survival, they're about working areas, and they're facing quite a lot, they're, and they're, 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 they're struggling to survive, so they're nearly not, it's not that they're not interested in that, they're a million miles away from that, so how, how do we get... What's on the board, what you're saying, what everybody else is saying, how did we get that into people's everyday life, way of working, way of thinking, way of breathing, people's skills? Yeah. I'm going to um, leave my question as well. <laughs> <laughs> Some privilege. Um, which is that you told us what the IPCC hasn't done in its third report, in his special report, um, uh, and, and, and what's unsatisfactory about it. Are there any aspects where they are giving clear pointers um, which we can hang on to and can, can uh, advocate? Yeah, well, um, the, the impact is going to be the one, big one. That's a really useful impact. And now I'm going to ask Caroline Rance, who's the climate campaigner for Friends of Scotland, to just give a tiny bit of background Oops, I think maybe you better come, come this way so you're in the screen. Um, a, a tiny bit of background on the, um, the research which was commissioned and, and, and the role that, as a civil society organisation, Friends of the Earth Scotland has. Thank you. Um, I'll talk for long enough to let Kevin think up answers to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the context of this visit, the reason that we asked Kevin to come up to Scotland this week uh, is that there's a new climate change law which is going through the Scottish Parliament at the minute. Um, can I ask how many people are aware of that, that just down the road, oh good, you are in a form of dreams. <laughs> but still, there are some of you within this room who are clearly interested in climate change, you care enough to be here tonight listening to this, who don't know that this is happening. And just down the road, in the Scottish Parliament, there are MSPs, literally just sitting around a committee room, deciding on our future, deciding on what role Scotland is going to play in the future of the planet. And us at Friends of the Earth and Stop Climate Chaos Scotland, we're quite concerned with the discourse around that climate bill. Um, and the reason that it came about was because the Scottish Government said they wanted to see Scotland playing our part in the Paris Agreement. The First Minister said that uh, she will see Scotland playing our full part in delivering 1.5 degrees. And then the climate bill came out. <laughs> um, it was published in May and it doesn't do those things. It's really weak. It's really poor. It, it says, despite everything that we just heard, the messages of urgency from the IPCC, everything we know about what we need to do uh, if we have any chance of keeping to 1.5 degrees, uh, all of the kind of media headlines that you heard about 12 years to save the world, it says, actually, in Scotland, yeah, we don't need to do anything extra for the next 10, 12 years. We'll just continue business as usual. And then maybe around 2040, we'll think about doing a little bit extra. And so it pushes all of this. It just kicks the can down the road. It pushes action way out to 2040, to 2050, and then we'll think about doing something extra. And that's absolutely not good enough. You all know that's good enough. <laughs> not good enough. So, uh, so Friends of the Earth and Stop Climate Chaos, we were we asked uh, Kevin and the Tyndall Centre at Manchester to do a bit of research for us um, to inform this debate. Because the way that the Scottish Government have approached this bill is, uh, it is quite democratic, it's bottom up. They kind of looked around them at the things that we know how to do today. They said, oh, we can maybe put some wind turbines over there and we can put some electric vehicles there uh, and then we can sort of add that up and that will get us roughly to that place by 2050. They didn't look at the big picture of what Scotland needs to do 
as part of the global picture. They didn't take a carbon budget. They didn't factor in any equity. They didn't apportion that down to Scotland and say, oh, okay, this is what we need to do. So that's the piece of research that we asked Kevin and his colleagues uh, at the Tyndall Centre to do. Um, and I think it's just really important uh, when you're fully informed at the end of Kevin's <laughs> lesson, um, that, that we all understand that we have a role to play in this. We absolutely, it's not good enough to understand this intellectually and, and then do nothing. We absolutely have a role in this. And we have to hold those people just down the road in the Scottish Parliament, we have to hold them to account and we have to make sure that they're making the right decisions and doing the right thing. Um, and a, a very small thing that you uh, may wish to do this evening, just to start in, um, is there's a clipboard making its way around, uh, which is just very simply a message to MSPs, to your MSPs, just saying that you care, that this is an issue that they need to work on. Um, but that's a small thing. Um, yeah, there will be, I'm sure, much more discussion afterwards about how people can get together and organise and collectively put pressure on. But this is a really key moment for Scotland. It's a big opportunity. Um, so take in all of the things that Kevin says and then do something with that knowledge. <laughs> I can't answer all of those. Well, I guess that because I'm hoping that in, in the course of your discussion, um, yeah, yeah. You, you might touch on some of these. I will do. Yeah. There will be more discussion afterwards. Right, so, so, yeah, yeah, okay. But, uh, I'll, I will discuss a lot more about the equity issue as I go through this um, and your very important point about private communities who are actually pivotal, both in terms of suffering from the impact, but actually are part of the solution. And I'll come back to that towards the end. Um, you know, I appreciate a lot of the comments that are made on, on animals and you know, I mean, what we're doing to the, you know, to the ecosystems of this planet have been here for pretty much, what, three billion years, probably with various forms of ecosystems since we've had some sort of life on this planet. And we've been here for a, a, a nanosecond and destroying huge numbers of those. You know, I, I, I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but it, it was looking somewhere recently at the, the mass of domestic animals compared to the mass of, of wild animals. And it's just basically, it's all domestic now. There are no wild animals left on this planet. Well, the portal point of view. So it's just it's just really disturbing what we're doing there. Um, uh, what, what can we do about China? Well, at least by example, would be not a bad, bad idea. Close our fossil fuel industry down um, with some just transition for the workers. But there are lots of other things we can do about um, about China. We're going to have to we have to tackle the WTO on that, and I'll come back to that again a little bit later. The World Trade Organization. We need to make sure that we we already don't import things if they're poisonous. If they've got lead-based paints in toys. We don't import them. Well, how come if they've got a high carbon footprint? How about we don't import those? Because they're also very dangerous to our children as well. So there are, we have to rethink some of that sort of agenda. Um, uh, I don't know where to go with all this. Um, <laughs> perhaps I'll pick them up as I, as, as I go. As I'll, try, I'll try and pick them up as I go through. Equity was an important part. I'll come back to that repeatedly. And, and very much professors and probably, probably a large proportion of you here are in the top 10 to 20 percent of global emitters. If you're on a plane once a year, put yourself in that category. Um, and those of you who aren't here at university, you're desperately aspiring to consume as much as possible. That's why you're in university. And of course, that's the measure of progress in our society. We don't have to be like that, but that's what we have at the moment. We, it's our job to kick it. Um, I'll make one comment on the system thing. This, I, I think the system and the individual, that sort of language is actually unhelpful. They're both they're, they're two sides of the same coin. And, and they're also important in the issues of leadership. Leadership is not top-down. Leadership is as much bottom-up as it is top-down. And I'll make that point some way that one of the points I wrote down here is that there's, there's a democratic contract that we have. So it, climate change is about politics. Not about with a big P, with a small P. Climate change is a political issue. I do not want to diverse from divorce from politics. It's not a science issue. It's a political issue. It's a cultural issue. Um, and that means we have a role in that. In a democratic society, we have a role. We are, we are contractually obligated to engage with our policymakers. If we sit our asses at home just moaning and not engaging, then it's not their fault, it's our fault. So it's a partnership between bottom up and top down. And I'll come back to that a bit more. And the energy vendor, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, it would help with the thing, and I'm putting it in boost this, but they should not have prematurely closed down the nuclear power stations. What you do not do is close down nuclear power stations prematurely. You may not build new ones, you do not close down your existing ones. That is a stupid thing to do when trying to deal with climate change. Um, it's about 5 to 15 grams of carbon dioxide per kilowatt hour compared with 
CCS at about 100 or 200 grams, uh, gas at 450 and coal at about 900. So it's very, very low carbon. Maybe you don't build any more, one, more but you don't close them down and, and expand the lignite like mine next to the Bond COP last year, which was offset, of course. It was a zero emission COP last year because they offset it, even though they expanded the lignite like mine next door at the time. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, there are lots of problems with some of these things that are ongoing, but we also have to look for the good lessons in there as well, and some good things that come out of uh, energy vendor in terms of solar and so forth. Anyway, I'll progress from that, and hopefully I'll touch on these as I go through, and if not, you can grab hold of me later on, um, gently. Um, <laughs> so what was our response to, to the challenge I'm sort of laying out here? Well, I think we have to start with a bit of humility. We just have to remind ourselves, particularly if people of my generation, I see quite a few of you here of my generation, I'm wondering, maybe even fractionally older. Um, the first IPCC report was 1990. So some of you here, your parents hadn't met. Your parents may have only just been reaching puberty when we had the first report out from the IPCC. So throughout, throughout all of your lives, your parents and I and other people of my generation have known what to do about climate change. Those who start struggling day to day. <laughs> And yet in 2017, emissions were 65% higher. So not only have we known what to do, but we just watched the emissions go up. We haven't cared about your future. A little more than a fashion accessory, as I often say. Um, and they're still rising. 2017, they went up by 1.5%. And almost certainly this year, the emissions will go up again. In 2018, 28 years after the first IPCC report, um, over a quarter of a century since the first Rio summit, emissions are still going up. And so we've had 28 years of optimistic rhetoric smiling fool to think we're going to solve it with technology or some other you know, simple solution. And this is a much more deeply rooted um, problem than we're prepared to accept. And we've had a whole litany of scams to stop us doing anything, offset. <laughs> yeah. The amount of climate change conferences where you can offset emissions. <laughs> Imagine what that means. If you offset emissions, double the price of the offset, because you only have about two, two pounds anyway. Double the price, pay four pounds, and it's a negative emission technology. We're sucking the CO2 out of the air, apparently, to fly around the world. Utter crap. But governments love this. That's why they develop a clean development mechanism so they can pay Ghana to reduce the emissions for us expanding our road network. And then we have the emissions trading scheme with so many permits issued that actually the prices remain virtually zero. Now, that is changing. But years, years later, after we've stuffed all the CO2 in the atmosphere, We've got afforestation, which has actually been used in Sweden now. We're going to expand our land of airport around Stockholm, the main airport in Sweden. It's been compensated for emissions because we're going to expand the forestry in Sweden. Plant a tree, expand an airport. <laughs> Speculative negative emission technologies. Yeah, when all of these things fail, we're already embedded in virtually all of the models that advising governments assume that these things will work. And not that they'll soak, you know, soak about 100 million tons here and there, you're talking about hundreds of billions of tons of CO2 to be sucked out of the system by these technologies that we don't really have yet, or we don't really have, we do not have. They may work, they may not work. Fusion may work, fusion may not work. And then when that fails, we've already got economists and engineers coming together to look at you know, firing rockets into the structure to spread out sulfur particles to reflect sunlight into space, or cloud brightening, which may be slightly less problematic. So we've already got people looking at these things. What we haven't done is reduce our CO2. <laughs> think it's a reasonable thing to do. Reduce our CO2. And we like to think it's all about China. But this is the UK or Scotland or Sweden or Denmark or France, the climate progressive countries. Imagine this PLCs, so not worried about you know, just the convenient boundaries they use. So, all oh, leading on climate change, yet the emissions have reached virtually unchanged since 1990. So, we'll often hear politicians and corrupted and co opted academics telling us how we've reduced our emissions. But actually, you know, look at Scotland, it's had no reduction in its emissions in how it operates since 1990. Nor is the UK, nor is France or Denmark. And in aviation and shipping, remember God, or not God, <laughs> climate only cares about carbon dioxide emissions. It doesn't care about your convenient um, accountancy framework. And, we, and what we've done internationally is we've said that emissions from aviation and shipping are the responsibility of God. Because no country takes responsibility of them. But they do change the climate, surprisingly. Basic physics. <laughs> So in aviation shipping, imports and exports, and we've had no reduction from these climate progressive countries. Now that gives a very different reflection, I think, mean, position mm -hmm. to start from, some humility. My generation has chosen to fail the next generation. And if you're in the next generation, you should be really pissed off at me. <laughs> but there's no point just being angry. You've got to be angry and you've got to be constructive. So how do you tone your anger down and make it come together collectively so you can start to drive change? Remember, you have power. You don't have to wait for power when you get older. You have power now in many, many respects, particularly collectively. Start to exert that power to push my generation who's chosen to fail you to do something differently. Or just take it from us. 
So what does the IPCC tell us about um, Paris? And I'll come back through this later on to, the, to Mark Ferry's point about this point, point about the Committee on Climate Change, which we were discussing this afternoon with one of the um, advisors to the, uh, to the bill, actually. Um, so, and I synthesise all, all of the IPCC in this one sentence, which is probably a little unreasonable. Um, it's all about carbon budgets from a, from a climate, from a temperature point of view. It's not about long-term targets. And we've known this for years. We had the first report on carbon budgets, which we did, I think, with, with Simon years ago, and um, looking at the carbon budget was in like 2006 and um, So, how big is the carbon budget that we have? The carbon budget is a total amount of CO2 we can dump in the atmosphere for any given temperature. And this, there's quite a lot of uncertainty around it, but it's a good enough proxy for us to understand what the policy element should, should be delivering. So, I'll take the stuff out of the synthesis report here and then then there's sort of headline numbers from that. To stay well below 2 degrees centigrade, we have something like 750 billion tonnes of CO2 that can dump in the atmosphere. And probably to quite a few of that means nothing. It's about as useful as one and a half or two degrees centigrade. And <laughs> unfortunately, we use this language, which is not meal to most people. But most of you probably got some basic maths and arithmetic, and if not, you've got your phone and calculate on it. So you've got 42 billion tonnes of what we've done to out in the atmosphere last year in CO2. So a quick calculation will tell you about, about 18 years of current emissions before we have nothing left for 2 degrees C. Forget 1.5, that's just 2 degrees C. Right? Now, of course, the 750 might be a bit bigger or a bit smaller. There's some uncertainty around that, and if you're sort of like, I, I would argue, actually, if you take any precautionary approach, you would go for a slightly smaller version of it. You'd think the climate sensitivity is a bit higher, but some people think the sun sensitivity might be a bit lower. So it could be a bit larger, a bit smaller, but it does not change the policy level. That's the base of the headline number from the, um, no, I can see. see. So let's look at this um, graphically. So this is one of my own, um, so I have this with my uncle lives in. We sat there now watching, <laughs> watching the Alba Exeter program, or the that, or the country West Western program that was. Um, so it's a crop that hung the island down. So this, these are our emissions historically. And um, before Paris, we were heading in this direction, it's like four to six degrees centigrade of warming, which I think is just worth bearing in mind the difference between now and ice age is about five degrees. So we're talking about you know, something that would normally occur over thousands or tens of thousands of years occurring in half an hour, basically. So you know, that's where we were heading before, according to the science. Then it, 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 we have to make sure we're, we don't have too much precision in the science. We have a lot of accuracy and we have ranges, but we don't have a lot of precision. So we don't know if it's 4 degrees C or 6 degrees C we're heading, but in that sort of direction where we were going. Now, with the Paris Agreement, we've reduced that significantly to something like 3 or 4 degrees centigrade of warming. But the only reason we've moved, with, the only real reason I think that we've moved from the other one to this one, and this ongoing discussion we're having with some colleagues on Twitter about this, particularly Glenn, Glenn Peters, who I have a lot of time for here, and we actually agree on this one, is that actually really that shift is because of the economic crisis. It's not because of judicious climate change policy. Mm. Now, we have, it happens to coincide with some improvements in climate change policy, but overall, the shift is almost certainly just because of the banking crisis. So we can thank them for that, but anything we can thank them for. Um, and to stay well below 2 degrees centigrade, we have something like 750 billion tons. I say it could be a bit more, it could be a bit less, depending on your view, whether you want to gamble your children's future or secure your children's future. Um, so that looks like 750 billion tons there or thereabouts. Um, that's zero emissions from energy by about 2050. And I won't go into talking a lot about agriculture, but it's a really important part of the picture as well, particularly in Scotland. Probably 25% of the warming roughly from the Scottish emissions have, have come from. Um, non CO2 agricultural type of issues, um, including meat, significantly in that. So it's an important sector. We know what to do about it. We know how to reduce the emissions by eating less red meat, moving away from ruminants, animals with two stomachs. So if you want to eat animals at all, it's animals with one stomach, pigs and chickens, that'll give you a sort of 50 to 75% reduction in emissions. If you're into a plant based diet, that helps even more, and certain plant based diets are better than others. So there are lots of things we can do about food, um, and obviously the waste is cycle, that's important as well. But the most important thing is actually to shift from Animals with two stomachs to not animals with two stomachs. That's the biggest, where the biggest jump can be made. And as an uncle who farmed black-faced sheep for 50 years, and my uncle did, he doesn't like me saying this, but really, you know, his sheep were part of the problem. <laughs> but we all, but we all even, or at least we did. Um, but that, that picture there is the for energy, and the Paris actually um, is, has this really important element about equity. As the Paris Agreement does, the Copenhagen uh, Accord did, the Kyoto um, uh, Protocol talks repeatedly about the equity implications, and that's basically saying that the wealthy nations will take longer to make the reductions, sorry, the poor nations will take longer to make the reductions than the wealthier parts of the world. And most of us accept that's a reasonably fair thing to do, but if you look at the CCC, for instance, the CCC do not embed any equity in their analysis. In fact, they would go the other way around, and it's highly inequitable what the CCC have done. I'll come back to that a little bit later. 
So there are, the CCC is not independent in that sense, it takes quite a political view about the UK should take a big colonial view and take a larger chunk of the, of the pie. So um, we had, uh, what I'm laying out here, I think it's far removed from this sort of enthusiastic cheering at Paris, that much goes in favour of having the Paris Agreement. And why is it we've done this? How is it we can be so enthusiastic about how we're achieving um, our, our targets, our goals, our commitments on climate change? And I think it's because the policymakers have received, and I would say have wanted to receive, a very different story. So, and it's by being dominated by a group of what I, well, what I refer to as integrated assessment models. They're mostly economists, but they're advised also by engineers and some scientists. They take a relatively simple climate model, they embed a broadly, generally equally from neoclassical growth model in the middle of it all, and then they bolt in some other stuff about transition speed and so forth in various algorithms. So it's all the equation thing you wind up. We are that pops us cost optimal, or sometimes they call it cost effective option. So it's a big model of the world with social costs of carbon, all those things embedded in them in, in mathematical forms. Um, and these, these have um, or imply massive carbon budgets, much bigger than comes out of summits, and therefore much less mitigation. And when you look at the median uh, level of the median scenarios for the 66% and better submissions for 2 degrees C submitted to the IPCC, you get out something like 1,600 billion tonnes of CO2. Remember before, it said it was about 750 from now. That's, that's from 2017. Yeah, so um, it looks like that. So what you have here is what you get out of science is like working group one. That's more like working group three, which I personally think should not be in the IPCC. I don't think we should have mitigation in the IPCC. I don't think working group three should have ever been there. Because it's so much more political than obviously the sciences. Science is as near as possible neutral. Scientists never, you know, science, science is more neutral, scientists never are, but the science gets near to that. The work group three doesn't get anywhere near, it's highly politicised. So for a likely chance of two degrees centigrade, we've got two options here. We've got the science telling us we've got 800 billion tonnes in 2017, or um, about 850, uh, 750 billion tonnes from 2018, and remember this year we've used it, so we're now getting very near to only having 700 billion tonnes from 2019. And we've got the modelers telling us, no, don't worry, you've got 1,600 billion tonnes. So, you know, and which one are you going to choose your policy maker? Which one are you going to choose as you're an academic flying to another essential conference around the world? Um, you know, so we all love this. It allows us to go to Bali on holiday and you know, all the rest of it. So, <laughs> how do you this, 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 along with uh, Dr. Slay's love um, and uh, Merchants of Doubt, are the two best climate change films that will ever come across, head and shoulders above anything else. This is a wonderful example of how simplistic men look at technology. <laughs> um, and it's how we've embedded climate change. So I really recommend that. And the, and the Merchants of Doubt is a wonderful film. And only recipes and um, Eric Conway. Excellent. The book is really good as well. And we've done that by pulling rabbits from the hats. This sounds really flippant, but it's not meant to be. This is actually what we are doing. Now, we are no different to the soothsayers advising Caesar about which day to go to war. So we've got these people who are conjuring up, and that's the appropriate term. I'm not saying we should, I'm not opposed to negative emission technologies doing research on them, but to assume they work is a moral hazard and is incredibly yes. dangerous. So we have conjured them up because you can't buy them. They're not <laughs> in the shelves at the supermarket. They're in the minds of a few academics. They've embedded a few computer models and buy up various algorithms. And people are starting to think about how you might have to deliver it. But these are not things that are there. And these are going to suck. And remember, these, these are in all of the models. It's not as if these are, you know, there's virtually no model for, for good attitude we see. It doesn't include these, these and or almost always both of them, massive levels of afforestation. There's hundreds of billions of tons of CO2 out of the atmosphere. But notice again, beyond the end of the century. And that's what we're relying on. I think that's really disturbing. It goes on. We're relying on this because we can't be asked to act over here. So Paris, some academics and policymakers, rather than focus on those in deep mitigation today, because that's massively challenging politically and economically, you'd have to question Davos or something like that, and we'd rather rely on non-existent technologies in the future. And so when I say we, I don't mean we, of course, you hardly be tired of being in Tuscany, you know that. And, I mean, the younger people, they, you invent the technology and suck our CO2 out with it, and pass it on to your kids to do the same thing. That's what we're doing. And so we're going to suck huge quantities of CO2 out of the atmosphere, you look at most of the scenarios, it assumes ongoing use of fossil fuels. That's convenient for the tax for the treasury, isn't it? And they absorb the taxes from it. And virtually no change in society. So the well we can remain there. And it's all not like we want to like our legs. It's a wonderful future, isn't it? That's because if there's no resemblance to any physics. So how do we go from um, a global position to Scotland? So I'm going back to our report now, how we um, shift from one to the other. 
So to limit our two degree sea rise, we have a carbon pie. So some simple stuff, and we'll manage to tart it. You can imagine that's a type of cake. So we've got a uh, mostly tart, and it could be a bit bigger, and it could be a bit smaller, depending on what the science, what your climate sensitivity is, and so forth. But it doesn't change the poison this. And we have to split this carbon pie amongst all of the world's countries. And you go, that, that obviously is a bit of a challenge. You may want to say, well, I want a bigger piece than everyone else. There are some interesting things in philosophy, whereby what you would do, you'd get the EU would negotiate for Ghana, and Nigeria would negotiate for the United States, China would negotiate for the EU or something like that. And then, actually, if you look in philosophy, it tells you quite a lot that actually what everyone tries to do is to make sure it's as fair as possible. <laughs> if you get China negotiating for China, the UK negotiating for the UK, or the EU for the EU, and Americans and Americans, everyone tries to fiddle it so they get the biggest piece. So there are some really good examples in philosophy about how to do this sort of thing, but we don't take it up to that, because we don't care about climate change. Um, so so what, what is a fair slice? The question we asked in the report, what's a fair slice for the OECD? And I'm not going into the details of this, but basically what we've assumed here are massive changes to the poor parts of the world, not OECD countries, you know, much more challenging than those covered in any of the literature. So it's not as if we let the poor parts of the world down. I haven't put the plots up, I can tell them about it if you want to, if you want to ask me. And we've then said, of the current budget for the globe, Two degrees centigrade, take off what we refuse for, assume for the non OECD, what's left for the OECD? And again, that could be a bit bigger or a bit, a bit smaller. Then we looked at the OECD and said, what's, what's the proportion for Scotland, for, for the UK? And we've done that on the basis of things like population, uh, GDP, and grandfathering, in other words, historical emissions. And we use it not just the one year before, but it would take like five or six years and then to average them out in case there's any anomalies. So we also study it in, in science. Um, and then we've asked, how much do the Scots get? Of that. And then we've done the same sort of thing there with, with population, GDP, and um, grandfathering again. So you, you, you know that as well. And we've done the same thing in Sweden. We've done it for the lands in Sweden. We've just done it recently for the EU because we asked to provide some information for the EU who's thinking about producing budgets. And that's the then numbers for Scotland, um, including innovation shipping, but excluding imports and exports. So that probably means nothing to most of you unless you're sort of spreadsheet geeks who love carbon, carbon, but to give a bit of a different feeling, that's five to nine years of current emissions. Five to nine years nice. to blow two degrees C out the window. Not 1.5, two degrees. And remember, this isn't a really fantastic chance at two degrees centigrade. This is just a, yeah, this is a, a reasonably good chance. You wouldn't get in a plane. I hope you wouldn't get in a plane at all, but if you were to get in a plane, imagine that, um, then you wouldn't get in a plane if it had a sort of one third chance of crashing, probably not. That would probably be quite good for emissions because people very quick stop flying. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's what's fair to accept here. So five to nine years, only for a uh, sort of 66% chance or so of two to the So um, what was that picture again? <laughs> um, so, uh, so if we take those budgets and say, well, what does that mean in terms of mitigation money? Because the overall budgets don't necessarily mean a lot to a lot of people. It's about a 10 to 15% reduction in emissions every single year starting now. And when it says now, I'm at the beginning of this year. So we're already a year behind. And remember, cumulative emissions mean that every year you don't hit your percentage, the next year the percentage is higher. And that's the big problem that I think a lot of people really struggle to grasp. It's different to long-term targets. So if you, hit, if you hit 7% this year, well done, except you're still way below what you should have been. So next year you're going to have to hit maybe 11 or 12%. If you fail that again, just hit 8%, then it's going to be higher again. And that's the problem because we chose, I chose, my generation chose to fail for 28 years. There's a very little budget left. We need to look at a total reduction from carbon dioxide from energy of about 80% by 2030. Completely different to what's in the climate bill. What all the sort of rhetoric <laughs> normally or indeed what we hear from the commission on climate change. And a fully decarbonised energy system by about 2035, 2040. And that's ships, industry, fridges, cars, everything. And remember, only 20% of the electricity we can of the energy we consume at the moment is electricity. 80% of it is not electricity. So there's a massive agenda just trying to electrify a lot of things as well as making low carbon electricity. Let's compare this with the CCC, which I have, I have a lot of time for them. Chris Stark, I've had a, a few meetings with him now, um, the, new, the new CEO at, uh, at, at the CCC. I think the Climate Change Act was saying to that, I think the Climate Change Act is a wonderful piece of legislation. It's way ahead of 2008, the Climate Change Act. It's way ahead of Sweden's climate law that out this year. It's still the best that's there. The problem is it relies, the minister, it relies on the minister with integrity to instruct the CCC to, to do things that, um, you know, like my own, to be more independent, to do the analysis more brutally, rather than just relying on us to really do things and massage it around an economic frame. It also, I think, requires the commissioners of the CCC, going back to Mark's point, I think the commissioners of the CCC, even though they've got a lot of time and respect for them, I think they have let us down. 
I mean, the commissioners and CCC have not held the, in, the, the, the line of integrity that I would expect people from their scientific foundation to have done. I think they have sold out. So I think the CCC has been um, only semi, semi-autonomous from government and has taken a political agenda, not a scientific agenda. Um, having said that, the Secretariat are excellent and they would give a, to a scientific agenda if they were asked to by the Minister and if the commissioners supported it. So there's the CCC scenarios. <coughs> Uh, or general pathway, take away the noise and plot that 2 degree centigrade and look something like that. And it's always the same if you use the Swedish, Swedish climate change law as well and get the same sort of thing. 2 degrees C is so much more demanding than what the CCC is saying. Remember, that's 2 degrees C, not 1.5. Why are there such differences? And I'll just pick on some of these ones now. First, the CCC, CCC's analysis is for an 80% reduction by 2050. It's actually not for 2 degrees centigrade. Now, I would argue that actually when the early days they used a framing of 2 degrees centigrade, or relative 2 degrees centigrade, that fed into the 80%. But they repeatedly have told me, when I've really pushed them on this, Chris Stark and others there, that they do not, they have not given advice on either 2 degrees centigrade or 1.5. And I've repeatedly pushed them on that. They said, we give guidance on the 80%. And the 80% came out of a view of 2 degrees centigrade, but they no longer advise on that. Uh, the course they can do is asked to by the minister. And the minister has not asked them to look at 2 degrees centigrade. The minister has asked them to look at 1.5 degrees centigrade, but with no change in the budgets up to 2032. In other words, don't look at anything. <laughs> the Scottish minister, thankfully, has written a letter which actually says, no, you can open up the, the box between, between now and 2032 as well. So the Scottish minister asked the CCC to do something that is really important. But the UK minister, Claire Perry, said, let's close the debate down. Um, so the CCC also assume a planetary uptake in negative emission technologies. The most conservative reading you could have of the CCC's work is 3 billion tonnes of CO2 sucked out of the atmosphere in the future when they will retire. Um, I think it's probably nearer 7 to 10 gigatons sucked out for the, city, for the UK. So that allows us to have much less mitigation rates. So we would argue in our work we have not included negative emission technologies. I would hasten to add, we, we think we should research them, should be a major funding programme on negative emission technologies, but we should not assume they work in our scenarios. Instead, we assume they work in all of our scenarios. The CCC ignored the equity sphere in Paris and every other agreement as well. So they say, we want a larger piece of the pie, and then they work out what's necessary to deliver on that large piece of the pie. I think that's unfair, I think it's in, not in line with Paris, and I think we should be pushing the academics again, while well, we're all typical quiet people, but we should be speaking loudly about this, saying that's not in line with what our commitments are. We explicitly embed an equity dimension in our work, which is why it's so different. The CCC analysis is for all UK CO2. We're focusing just on the energy component here. We've done that in the Scottish report, we've looked at deforestation and process emissions, but the reason we separated these out is that process emissions in cement, which are about 7% of the world's emissions at the moment, that's the, from the manufacture of the chemical process of making cement. Cement is essential for the development of poor parts of the world, and indeed for the, making the low carbon agenda in rich parts of the world. And to, to penalise poor parts of the world who want to have a decent infrastructure, I think is unfair. So there are no alternatives at scale yet to cement. So we've made some scenarios about that and lots of other things in there to make it as low emissions as possible, as quickly as possible. But I think it's really important. I just give some sort of idea of it. In the EU, I think we, can, we use about 300 kilograms of cement per person, and the Chinese use about 3,000 kilograms per person, because they are building the infrastructure that we already have. And um, deforestation, we've already deforested and used the land for all sorts of things, and then we blame other people when they deforest. I don't think we should be deforesting, but I think we are part of the problem. When Brazil chooses to deforest, or Malaysia or Indonesia, that's partly our problem. It's not just theirs. We've done that. So I think just to blame them for it is inappropriate. So I think these things should be global overheads. And we can discuss that later in the because, because there are no separate, there are no alternatives to those things at scale at the moment. And the CCC use uh, five-year budgets and which exclude aviation and shipping. I think they should be included. Now I understand the Scottish Parliament is actually including aviation shipping, so all credit to it for doing that. I don't know how it's actually doing it, but um, <laughs> it's good that it's actually doing that. But the, but the UK it is in the 80% target, but it's not in the budgets. Don't ask me what the logic is for that. I can't understand it. And um, we include aviation shipping. So there's some big differences between us and the CCC. There are some other ones as well. But I would, you know, if you think what they're doing there is right, then you get a different budget. So um, let's come towards the end now. We're going to some real action on climate change. What can we do to deliver on it? I just realised I meant to put some other slides in. I took it out anyway, didn't I? Um, they were the ones that actually said what we do need to do. <laughs> so I thought that. So CO2, as I said before, right from the sort of early experiment, is hugely skewed. And you're probably familiar with this. This plot, it sort of comes out of the, the chances of Piketty work. This is where the emissions are from our activities. And, and I think this is really important. This is at a global level, but I'm pretty sure that this works in, in Scotland as well. It probably works in this audience here. 
Someone did some work, it's really recently looking at um, professors. Professors had five times the uh, carbon footprint of their postdocs and 15 times of their PhDs. 15 times. Um, but I'm sure they're worth it, of course. <laughs> so, what I'm trying to say is that the emissions are massively skewed. And if you live in Bears Den rather than John Chapel, then you know, your emissions will be much higher in Bears Den than some poor person bringing up a terminal block in John Chapel. So, they'll be the same in Scotland. Most emissions are due to the activities of a few. 50% of global CO2 comes from 10% of the world's population, 70% of global CO2 comes from 10 to 20% of the population from our activities. Yeah, that's the industry's doing things for us, so industry's factored in there. These are all emissions from that globally. I would argue, given that, and um, what I'm saying there, you've got a, that there is no way out of this. If we're serious about the 2 degrees C framing, and as someone said before, we like to blow right the way through it, I think that's true, but if that's the case, we need to be honest. We need to let poor people know in other parts of the world that we're not going to make reductions for them, and therefore they need to be adapting to four, five, six degrees. So we should be honest about that. If we are going to hit two degrees centigrade, I would argue this is a frontal twist. I'm not saying what the details will be, but first, you have to get off the emissions curve now, and there's no way you can do that with kit and tech, even though as an engineer, and I really wish you could, my sister said, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer, if you design and build offshore oil platforms, so I've got some idea of engineering. Um, you know, we need profound changes that have to be regulated for by the high emitters, by people like me. I mean, I'm, this all inspector is slightly different, but my guess is most of us are fairly high emitters. Um, and so we need to have to see that. And that can drive emissions down very rapidly indeed. You no know, start gets off the curve. And it also allows the poor parts of the world to see their emissions rise, which is what we want. I want to see emissions in poor parts of the world going up, because I do not want the poor to suffer as a consequence of climate change. I want them to benefit from it. In the near term, we need also, and this takes a little bit longer, but not much longer, very stringent energy efficiency standards and conservation as well. But we have to watch out for the rebound effect. You have this paradox that every time we save some money on one thing, we buy a jet ski or another flight. So you, but that's not insurmountable. We can do lots of things around that. We have metering tariffs and all sorts of other tools that we can use to address that. And of course, we do require a massive shift in our energy system to becoming fully decarbonized. Not, not low carbon, zero carbon. It's one reason CCS can't be part of it. CCS is going to be 100 to 200 grams in 74 per kilowatt hour. It's very high. So it's 10 to 30 times higher than renewable and nuclear. So we need, a, and I call it Marshall style, not because I think George Marshall's you know, plans to stop the communists coming to Europe was the right thing, in fact it was the right thing, but there were lots of those reasons. Um, but actually the, the reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War gives us a flavour of the sorts of changes we're talking about. We're not talking about piecemeal adjustments with the odd bit of carbon tax and all the other tweaking that the integration assessment models and everything else does on this. We're talking about something much, much more fundamental. This is, a, this is akin to the shift in productive capacity society in World War II. I mean, people don't like these metaphors, but they capture the essence of what, what we're talking about here. Even if we don't have to you know, agree with why we're doing it, we're not going to make tanks this time, we're going to make trams. Um, and just to give a flavour of what this is like and why it is we don't like it, I want to say one why it is we don't like it, I mean, why it is that we, the people that set the agenda, the Davos set, including us glutamati professors, um, why, why we don't like it. It's because it actually means the, the resources and the labour that go into allowing us to have large homes, holiday homes, second homes, prestige cars, SUVs, multiple car ownership, highly mobile lives, frequent flyer levy, uh, frequent flyer um, miles, all that sort of things, business and first class, well, high levels of consumer goods, and then reliance in Scotland and the oil and gas industry. The resources go into those, both the labour and the economic resources, this is not an issue about being a socialist. This is simply saying that those resources are needed to make the Marshall style transformation of the energy system. So we can, go, we can go back to all this inequality once we've got back to zero energy. <laughs> so they make the very smart sustainable development criteria they might consider. From a climate perspective, all of this in here is getting us off the, you know, off the carbon-based energy system. So once we go back to that, we can head back to massive inequality and all that other stuff if we want. So it's not a socialist agenda. It's simply a gem, agenda of maths, science, and our commitments. We need a zero carbon industrial strategy. And we can now talk about that again. The last, that, that language is likely spoken about the industrial strategy. You would imagine a will know that for 30 years or so, that debate was closed down. You couldn't have an industrial strategy. You have to believe in something called free market. And um, which is, of course, there's never been any free markets. So there has been a market mechanism. But anyway, um, so and there is a positive narrative around this. This is massive. This comes back to Jan's point over there. This is there is massive um, jobs opportunity here. Secure high quality jobs for the next two generations in making the transition. Just look at the rubbish housing in Scotland. I quite like it aesthetically, but it is terrible. As my Swedish friends point out, 
their tents are more efficient than our houses. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we need to retrofit the existing housing stock that's going to be here in 2050, which is probably most of the houses, 25 million houses in the UK, probably most of those 17 million or so will still be here in 2050. We need to make sure all new houses are passive houses and hopefully have to energy as well. So there's a whole lot of work there. We need to eliminate fuel poverty. Every government has tried to do that and fundamentally failed since the Second World War. And so we spend a fortune on health and bills for kids with bronchial problems because they're living in houses that are full of fungus. We know that the landlords are making a fortune. Um, we need to improve our urban air quality. Particularly, of course, it's the, it's the poor kids living in the cities that are getting affected by the, the, um, the rat routes that we all use as we drive in and out of the cities. So there's and the IPR, IPR does some interesting work on that in London uh, with the extra cases of congestion charge. Strong indigenous tourist industry. Every pound that flies into the UK, two pounds seventy-three flies out from a um, from a tourist point of view. Not surprisingly, because it's often a bit warmer somewhere else. Um, a prosperous and healthy future for our own children, and and perhaps showing some international leadership. Now, actually, in this case, I want to say it's in Sweden and also in Scotland. I think you are you have. You have a sense of being a more progressive place than the UK. I'm not saying it's all going to be easy. I'm not saying that you all agree with that. But I do get, maybe I have to be romantic because I've been coming here for so many years of my life, I've been coming here. But I do, it does feel somehow slightly more that it has a, a social contract. Sweden's got it much more strongly. Scotland still feels like it has something like that. Look at the referendum in Scotland. It, it may not think it was very good, but it was much better than the crap we had about Brexit. That was, that, was, that was how not to do a referendum. The Scottish one, regardless of whether you thought it went one way or the other, I thought it was a much, a much richer debate that was had up here. And that was okay, there, there were lots of problems there as well. Um, so, are there any deep system changes around the corner? But um, what I'm suggesting here is system change. You know? um, Someone said, we have, Should we talk about system change? There's no choice. We either adapt, we either change the system rapidly to reduce our emissions, and that's massive system change, or we don't bother, and then system change hits us called climate change. So one tent has a slight time lag. So system change is inevitable. It's a, it's a, a, a natural outcome of our failure to date. Um, when I went to Bonn last year to the COP, I was really depressed when I came back. It was, it was the worst. I don't know if many of them anyway, so they were flying, so it's quite hard to get them. I'd get to Bonn. Um, and it was the worst I've ever been to. And, and I started to think about it, and I sort of wrote something on the way back. And really what I was thinking about was that you know, whether it's politicians, scientists, academics, businesses, journalists, civil society, we're all going to hell in a handcart. And we're going there fast. And I think we need to learn about that. But so, and my question then to myself, was, I was really depressed, it was a two-day journey back to Sweden. I was really quite depressed. So I wrote this cathartic piece for myself. Is there any light in there? I'm trying to write it. It's often when you write, you start to think of um, And I uh, wanted a picture of this. All going to hell in a handcart. Put your choice of politicians on. Is that what you know, Musk? <laughs> so, so I wrote something, which was actually just for myself, but actually um, uh, something called The Conversation, which some of you might know, picked up sort of academic blog type pieces, that got picked up in there, and uh, you know, it got reduced a bit in length, and all my like, nice flowery words got taken out. Anyway. Um, so hope from chaos, could political upheaval lead to a new green epoch? Which sounds a bit desperate, but actually I think there's something in it, so bear with me for a second. 2008, 10 years ago, I would argue there's been a massive set of huge systemic upheavals since 2008. Um, first of the banking crisis, go back to 2006 and say, I think the Chancellor should sign a cheque for half a trillion pounds for next year. And of course, no one would, no one dreamed that was appropriate at all. You yeah, there's something there, yeah, sorry, it's just, just the air getting in that's like, oh, no, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> so, quantitative easing, I think the banking crisis was something that no one envisaged occurring, or virtually no one. It was a massive system change. And I'm not saying these are good or bad. I'm not saying any of these things are good or bad. You can make your own judgment on that. And we had quantitative easing, massive quantitative quantitative easing. My personal view is we shouldn't have spent it all on the banks. We spent half it on the banks and half it on the civil engineers and the oil infrastructure. <laughs> and social media. Who would have ever thought that social media would take off like it has? And after the last election, it was interesting to hear a number of editors on Radio 4, high emitting, privileged, middle class person who listened to Radio 4. And, <laughs> and uh, they were talking about the idea that actually they no longer made the weather on the elections. They said actually it's social media. And a lot of people argue that's the same for Trump and Obama, and to some extent, Bernie Sanders. But then Sanders and Corbyn, I think, are really interesting. The idea of the Americans, not that far off. I mean, if Sanders has stood against Trump, Trump, there's a reasonable chance, and quite a lot of people have said this, that he could have beat, beat Trump because he's actually anti establishment, as Trump's just a rich boy. So, so he, there would have been you know, an interesting competition between the two. So, but the idea that Sanders, a man who said he was a socialist, wasn't shot 
It's quite an achievement in the States. So this is just a change. But Corbyn, everyone was against Corbyn. The PLPs, I don't party were against Corbyn. The newspapers were against him. The Guardian was against him. The I was against him. The BBC was against him. No one liked Corbyn, except for the social media. And he did remarkably well. And he has changed the discourse, whether you like Corbyn or not, he has changed a lot of the discourse in the UK as a consequence. So I think these are interesting system changes. Brexit and Trump. Who, go back 10 years. Who would have thought we'd have something like Brexit that would be coming out of the EU? I mean, that wasn't something that people were envisaging other than maybe, maybe France was, I don't know. And who would have thought someone like Trump would get in the US? I mean, it's like, you know, Forrest, well, not Forrest Gump, that'd be much better. But anyway, <laughs> I mean, we thought it was pretty bad with, with Bush too. But, you know, um, but Trump is an amazing character in some respects. But actually, they raise questions about the, the importance of the establishment and how come questions have been asked about that establishment. That's what's really important here, regardless of whether you think it's a good or bad thing. The Arab Spring. No one saw the Arab Spring coming. OK, it turned out to be a utter disaster. I'm not saying it's is good or bad. But no one expected the Arab Spring. The plummeting price of renewables that keep coming down at the moment, they're not, they're not stabilising at the moment, they seem to keep coming down. And that is, that's causing a lot of problems for investors in energy, because you don't know whether what you're investing today is going to be much cheaper tomorrow. And a massive rise in the concern of the fossil fuels, I think, and even the IMF saying that fossil fuels are, are, are really problematic. So I think there's a whole suite of these things. And what I try to make a comment here is that in themselves, each of these disruptions, they are massive disruptions. And so, you know, when you live in a nice environment like Edinburgh, you come out of university every day, you forget these things happen to us. Even the austerity agenda, I mean, that gentleman was talking about people he's dealing with, they suffer the austerity agenda. Simon and I, I don't think we'd spot the austerity agenda, did we? We didn't have to really cut off where we went for dinner or where we went on holiday. So the austerity agenda was felt by some people and not others. But there were still big disruptions. Um, but they were evolutionary, I would argue, in contemporary society. But broadly aligned, I would suggest that you could see something here that guides more towards a much more revolutionary shift in society, and perhaps even a progressive and epoch-changing confluence of circumstances. It's in language there, but, but um, I'm not saying it's going to happen. And I think if, uh, if you left them just sort of chaotically or randomly, there would just be chaos. It would be a disaster. But if we start to try and align these to make a, an argument, a progressive narrative, whether you're left or right, a progressive narrative of what a good future looks like, I think, which we failed completely in Brexit to do that, in one way or another. I mean, we didn't provide a lot of discussions about a good future. It was all about fear on both sides. So a revolutionary shift. And I would also say that most political and economic pontificators but just by naysayers and established elites, and that includes professors, grey-haired professors, remain incapable of seeing beyond their familiar 20th century horizon. I hear repeatedly people talking about what we can do to solve the energy crisis in the 20th century. I'm not in the 20th century, and nor are they. That quite few of the ones my university is in the 19th century. Um, <laughs> but the 21st century is already proving how the future is a different country, and could yet be shaped by alternative interpretations of prosperity and stability and equity. And that comes back to us. You're a massive, powerful force here. You can change the way that people vote, or the way that the MPs and MSPs vote in, in Scotland by your engagement with them, or by your not engagement with them. Either way, they'll be influenced. So do we have something we can offer this new agenda? I would prefer to think post-growth. I don't want to go on about growth one way or another. I think, I think it's, an, it's a completely unhelpful term to use, homogenous framing of the whole of society in one unit it's called dollars or pounds or whams. And be open-minded about technical opportunities and limitations. Far too many of us as engineers are um, wedded to particular technologies. We need to be much more technology agnostic, but think about the broader sustainability criteria. Consider short-term rationing of energy. That's what the issue is about. We have to ration energy, because in the short term, you can't make it decarbonised, so ration it. Stand up to the bullying of the status quo, the city, the Davos set. The amount of academics I come across, particularly PDIs who feel to some extent, tailed in their freedom to speak by their supervisors. We need to open that agenda up. We do not want to hear too much more from people like me. Um, do we have the cogency, tenacity, and courage to escape? I was tempted not to use this language because it all sounds a bit too picking on this easy expression neoliberal, but I couldn't really find another way around it. I think it does describe it. You know, the neoliberal consensus that we've had, not consensus for most of us, the neoliberal, neoliberal consensus that has driven a lot of the elites in our society post Second World War, really, I think, do we have the courage to question that? I think we're going to have to if we're going to solve climate change. So to conclude, climate change is system change. Um, and if we want to use the sort of logic of carbon budgets rather than the astrology that informs most of our modern work today, <laughs> I think it begs fundamental questions of our norms and of our paradigms. We need to transform the energy supply, listening to the Marshall-style transformation of it, and moving the resources of society to help do that. We need massive penetration of most efficient energy use technologies, 
We need profound shifts in the behaviour and practices of people like me and the high emitters, not just the Al Gores, but you know, plenty of us in that top 10, 20 percent. We need to reframe success, value, and progress. I mean, and you just think about the people who seem to be successful in the news and everywhere we look, it's all those that have massive carbon footprints, have massive consumption. That's considered success. Living in a small terrace house somewhere is not successful. That's a sign of failure. It's like Maggie Thatcher said eight years ago, if a man's on the bus, they've obviously failed. Um, you know, they should go on the bus, they should be in a private car driving around. And that is not the way you should be looking at the world. We need to reframe that, that um, um, issue. And I also think, um, I did a lot of work in economics years ago on my PhD, even though I'm an engineer, and I do think our current economic model is simply not fit for purpose. In no other discipline would you use the current marginal economic growth model. It's all about small changes near equilibrium. What we are absolutely certain about, we're talking about system level changes far away from equilibrium. You would never use um, laminar flow to understand turbulent flow in aerodynamics. You would never use Newtonian mechanics to understand quantum mechanics. So almost every other discipline has different framings at different scales, but not economics, not the current form of economics. There's plenty of good schools out there if you want to economics and so forth, but the current one is certainly not fit for purpose. Great for telling you that competition between sock shops on the high street, but not telling you about whether you should put a certain technology in India or something like that. So it can't deal with us. This has to start now, you're competing in about three decades. Our choice is between a short-term real politic and, or a sustainable long-term real climate. So it's between short-term economics or 30 and a half billion years of physics. And then um, my, my money goes in the latter. Um, but we've a long way to go. Do we really care about these people? When we think it's reasonable to have private yachts, do we really care about our own children? When we think it's reasonable to invest billions into space travel, which I always humorously trying to point out, I'm actually not completely against, because as long as the tickets are one way, they're only... Bill Gates, Elon Musk, and so there, paying off their carbon footprints to Pluto, uh, having to fund their tickets, and it's only one way. Um, do we really care about um, future generations when we think it's reasonable to put, in my case, 85 kilograms of flesh and 3,000 kilograms, 3, kilograms of car to drive 10 kilometers to pick up six kilograms of groceries, is that a reasonable thing to do? Yeah, <laughs> but it's not. Do we really care about um, migrants entering our land in, 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 in Europe who are coming from Syria, where they did have 12 years of drought, that not caused the climate change issue, not caused the war in Syria, but certainly exacerbated these things. When we think, this is almost somewhere past in Cheshire, when we go out cycling, there's plenty of bedrooms there that could be birthed into places coming from elsewhere in the world. So there are plenty of things that we should be doing. Do we care about other species? We're going to wipe out pretty much all the coals anyway. They're pretty much gone on sadly. We think it's reasonable to establish a gas network now. Sweden's building a new gas terminal in Gothenburg. The EU is planning a whole look, a suite of new gas pipelines to bring gas across to Europe for the next 30, 40, 50 years. Gas is very high carbon, carbon, very high carbon fuel. Do we really care about living in this amazingly beautiful, stunning planet, floating in this inky darkness? We don't know anywhere in anything like this near, near, nearby that we can get to anyway. We think it's reasonable to fly to a climate change conference or a holiday in Bali. Um, Ultimately, as Alex Stephan said, winning slowly is basically the same as losing outright. In the face of both triumphant denialism, yeah, Trump and his, his friends, and, and predatory delay, I would argue pretty much everything in the UK, Scotland, all the private progressive countries and the predatory delay one, trying to achieve climate action by doing the same thing, the same old ways, guarantees defeat. It means defeat, it guarantees defeat. Um, Scotch Climate Bill, there's some suggestions to think about. Actually, I don't actually have to agree with them, but there's some things we could think about pushing our MSPs to reform the bill to make sure it is fit for purpose in the 21st century. So on that note, thank you very much. Just those of you who don't, just stand up, turn around. Um, we're just having a, a three-minute break, so you can you can talk to your neighbours. Would you? I'm going to pass around some post-its in the last 15 minutes, um, uh, uh, in a little while, and I'm going to invite you to put one thing that you're going to do after. But in the meantime, talk among yourselves.